So then the question naturally is, what is a qalb that's salim? What is it? What is a sound heart? And then how do you attain a sound heart? But before I talk about that, I want to go into the importance of the heart in terms of dictating our actions. I want to give you guys an example that all of us can pretty much understand. If you think about a person who, is, who has just fallen madly in love with another person, this is something we all we can understand at some level. How does that person act towards the one that they love? When someone loves another person, especially when someone is in love with another person, that person will desire nothing more than to please and be close to the one they love. If the person that they love asks them for something, they'll drop anything to do it. The greatest happiness comes with being near the one you love. And so there is an obedience that comes with love. It's a natural consequence of love. When you love someone, you do what pleases them. When you love someone and they ask you to do something, you hear and you obey. This is a natural consequence of love. And it's not something you have to force yourself to do. It isn't like, oh man, you know, if it, it, Romeo doesn't, didn't have to force himself you know, to go out of his way to go, oh man, now I gotta go spend time with Juliet. Like, it's, it's not something that, that he had to force himself to do. This is something that you, that the one who's in love desires nothing more than to be with the one they love. Whatever you love most becomes your master. And I'm gonna argue that everyone, I mean, here's the thing, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, you still obey something. You still have something that fills your heart. You still have something that you love most. But for each person, it may be something different. So for some, that thing which they love most is money. So now money becomes their master. And they will do anything for money. Others, the thing that they love most is status. So they'll do anything for status. To have that status in the eyes of people, to have people look at them, look up to them, that is what is their master. There are some people who what they love most is another person. It may be someone that they're in love with, it may be their husband, their wife, their children, and so they'll do anything for that. But every single person obeys and worships something. Some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran that they take as their, that thing that they worship, which is actually called an ilah. An ilah, you know like when someone wants to become a Muslim, what do they say? What do you say to become a Muslim? La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It's just, you know, it's a very simple but very, very deep statement. You are saying, I bear witness. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. You're saying, I bear witness that there's no ilah except for God. But what's an ilah? An ilah is this what is what I'm describing. An ilah is that which fills your heart, it's that which is your master. And believe me, there are people who take money as an ilah. They will do anything to get money. Do they not kill for money? Do people, do, do people not steal for money? Do people not commit suicide because they lost money? Yes or no? So this is clearly a god. It is something that they're worshipping because they cannot live without it and everything they do is for the sake of that thing. Similarly, some people, their ilah is status. Yes, I will do anything to keep my reputation, to, 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 you know, to, to, to have that status and that power. Some people worship power. We got a lot of those in, you know, in, our, in our countries as, as leaders. They worship power. They'll do anything to keep power, including massacring their own people. Am I right? Is this true? 
They worship status. They worship power because they will do anything for it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there are some people who take as their ilah their hawa. They take their hawa as their ilah. Hawa, what is hawa? Desires. There are people who take their own desires as their Lord. How do you, you know, here when we look at this ayah, what is this talking about? Obviously people don't pray to their desires, right? Does anybody make dua to their desires or pray to, or make an idol out of their desires? So obviously the concept of an ilah is not just restricted to what you pray to physically, but what your heart is really filled with what you put at the center of your universe. And for some people, that's their own desires. You know this concept of, well, why did you do so and so? Because I felt like it, or because it made me happy, or because it made me feel good. Do we live in a society that worships physical pleasure? Yes, no, yes. The idea is, and what you're told by advertisers and billboards and movies, is that if it feels good, then it's good. As if ultimate good is defined by what feels good. What is that? That's a worship of pleasure. That's a worship of physical pleasure. There's an, that becomes the criteria of how I live my life. It makes me happy, regardless of who it hurts. Regardless of whether it's right or wrong, it makes me feel good, so I do it. This is, this is as God is describing, these are people who worship their own desires. So that brings us now back to what is Islam? When I say I'm a Muslim, what does it mean? Well, the word Muslim, what does it mean? It means a person who has lovingly submitted. Submitted to what? A person who has lovingly chosen, willingly chosen, that I'm not going to submit to money or status or my desires or, or, or other people, I'm going to submit only to my Creator, only to God. And that's the meaning of the statement, La ilaha illallah. There is no ilah, there is no true ilah except for God. That's the only thing that should have that place in my heart and in my life. So this is all very theoretical somewhat. How do you know this in, in practice? Like how, how can we really see this um, more practically? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you guys to reflect on a few questions that make it more practical. I'm going to ask you to think about, and you don't, have to, you, know, you don't have to say these out loud or anything. Answer these questions. Number one, what do I think about most? What do I think about most? Throughout my day, you know, my mind is, you know, typically working all the time. What's occupying my thoughts most of the day? I see some people smiling. <laughs> is everybody aware of the answer for themselves? Yes or no? Can you nod if you know? Do some people have no idea what they think about? Or do you pretty much know? You all know? Yes? Yes? Okay. We're not, and we're not asleep. We know. We think about something. What is it? What's that thing that you think about most all day? And in extension to that, it keeps you up at night. You know, like sometimes you have trouble sleeping because you're still thinking about that same thing. Okay. Hold on to that. What is that thing? Second question. Last time you cried, what was it about? What was it about? Last time you got really, really angry, what was it related to? Really angry, like you really lost it. What, what triggered it? And the time before that, what triggered it? And the time before that, what triggered it? Get to the heart of it. What was it? What was being threatened that made you get that angry? Was it your ego? 
Was it someone you care about? Was it your money? Was it status? What was it? What causes you the most anxiety? You know, we suffer from anxiety. What is it that causes you anxiety? You know, there's some source of anxiety in your life. What is it? What are you most afraid of? And what are you most afraid of losing? You know, there's, there's certain things in our life, everybody knows what, what it is for them. You're so, so scared, you're terrified that, something would, that this thing would be taken away from you. Am I right? What is that thing? Okay, so I'm seeing a lot, somewhat blank faces. Are you guys like coming to, to, to answers in your head? Okay. What is the source of your greatest heartache, pain? What is it? Okay. Now, how many people had basically the same thing or related to the same thing to answer all of these questions? Or it was somewhat related? Yeah, okay. This is called a false attachment. These things, this, this thing, whatever it is for, for each of you, sometimes it's your job, sometimes it's your business, it's your career, maybe it's, you know, status in the community, maybe it's other people, <laughs> it's other people. <laughs> for this side of the room, it's typically other people. Um, why do I say that? Because typically for women, that's our, you know, that's our thing. Is it, it, our, our attachments are typically to other people. And, and for men, it may or may not be something, something different, maybe. Their job or... A lot of times it has to do with status and image and how, how people perceive you. But everybody has their thing. Now the question now is, why, okay, well, what's the point of this? The point of this is when, when I really am saying truly, La ilaha illallah, I'm truly saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, I bear witness. By the way, bearing witness to something is not a light matter. In fact, there's a hadith that says that, Min akbar al one of the worst of the major sins is to bear false witness. Bearing false witness is, is a major sin. So bearing witness is something pretty heavy. You better be sure if you're gonna if you're gonna wear witness to something. So when I say that I bear witness that there's nothing worthy of being an ilah other than God, then I am saying that the thing that should answer these questions, or the majority of these questions should not be my spouse, my children, my job, my status, my money. It should be God. And this is a practical, practical way to assess La ilaha illallah. Because I began by talking, you know, theoretical. Yes, we love God most. Yes, we say that. We all can say that. Yes, I love God most. Do you really love God most? Because the the perfection of la ilaha illallah, the perfection of tawheed is really, this is how you start to see it in practice, is that, yes, if I really love God most, let's go back to the example of the person in love. What happens when a person's in love? Do they have to force themselves to think about the person that they love? Oh, it's two o'clock. Okay, I have a reminder in my phone. I have to think about her now. Time to think about her. Okay, all right, let me think about her. <laughs> you don't have to remind yourself to think about the one you love. You can't stop thinking about the one you love. It's, it's an obsession. Are we like that with God? Like, really? Are we like that? We say we love God most, right? And we just finished agreeing that one of the consequences of love is that I'm constantly remembering the object of love, the beloved, right? And yet there's a disconnect. I say I love God most, but the thing I'm thinking about all day is actually my job. It's actually my money. It's actually my husband. It's actually my wife. It's actually my kids. So then how do I then claim that I love God most? There is an imperfection 
I mean, there, I'm saying something with my tongue, but I am not actually saying it with my heart. I'm not actually saying it with my actions. How does this start to become clear? Well, you're going to be tested. And there will be situations that you're put in where Allah will test you in your love and in those things that you love most. I'll give you an example. If the thing that you love most is money, well, now all of a sudden, God says, okay, yes, you can have a business, that's fine, that's halal, but you cannot deal in interest. Meaning, this can restrict certain things about your business. Well, what do you love most? What do you love most? Okay, yeah, I love to have a big house. Is it, are you allowed to have a big house? Yes or no, it's halal. But what if, in order to have that big house, I have to take this huge mortgage on huge amounts of interest? Okay, well now again, it's my love is being tested. Well, what do I love most? The, when we really look at this, it's very conceptual, but in practice, we will choose what we love most. And a lot of us love the fancy car more. A lot of us love the big house more, practically. Even though my tongue says I love God most, but practically, what do I choose? I just, I, I love the car. I love the house. I love to have a lot of money. So yes, okay, I'll sell alcohol. Yes, okay, I'll deal in interest. These are statements louder than the statement of the tongue of what you love most. You will choose what you love most. And that's why you have to be very careful what's filling your heart. If what is filling your heart, if what you really love most, if what's on your mind all day, and the thing that has the power to make you most angry and most sad and cry and all these things is anything other than God, then believe me, that will be what you choose when given a test. That's what you're going to choose. And there's other examples of this. If what I love most is to look beautiful to society, I wanna, I wanna look nice and believe me, a lot of people are tested in this way, especially women. It's important to me to look good. So now the test comes, well, you need to dress modestly. You need to dress a certain way. Allah puts a dress code down. So now the question is, what do I choose? And for a lot of women, it is a big struggle. And sometimes it's hard because we choose what we love most. It's so important to me that my hair you know, looks nice, or it's so important to me that I, you know, I follow the fashion statements. And so then again, when we're tested, this is what we choose. The natural next question is usually, um, okay, we start to pinpoint what are these, these things that have too much importance in my life. How do I make a law number one? In, in reality, not just lip service. And I'm gonna get into that, I'll, you know, leave you with just a couple practical steps or practical recommendations. You'll find that the other, the other aspect of taking, remember the example I started with about the gas tank and the orange juice? Remember that? Okay, I'm gonna come back to that. The reason is that I talked, I, I alluded to this, but when you put orange juice in a gas tank, the, the car doesn't work, but it also breaks the car. So now I'm gonna actually touch a little bit about emotional pain and devastation and the, 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 the pain that actually is associated with false attachments. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we said, He created the heart to be filled with God to be filled with the love of God, you know, first and foremost. If I fill it with something other than God, guess what else happens? Besides failing these tests, I actually hurt myself. I'm actually causing myself an excruciating amount of pain. And so when you look at those things that you answered, suppose it's your job, or it's school, or it's your spouse, or it's your children, 
Guess what happens? That very thing, your job or your money or your status or your children or your spouse also will be that which hurts you the most. Will also be the cause of your greatest pain. Your deepest and most constant pain. Am I right? That very thing. If it's money, it's constant anxiety, constant agitation, constant anger, you know, worry. That thing that you're loving as you should only love God actually will be that which hurts you. So it's kind of like you are, you're the one stabbing yourself in the heart. You're doing it to yourself because you're taking that thing that, and you're loving it in a way that it was not intended to be loved. And I, I, I think it's a little more obvious when it comes to material things, right? Money, status, these things. But what's less obvious, and this is one of the things I focus a lot in my book on, is people, is people. And I think that the reason this is not obvious is because obviously we're never told, I mean, naturally we're supposed to love people, right? It's a good thing to love people. So then why do they cause us so much pain? What's, what am I doing wrong? And I think that a lot of, especially a lot of women ask this question, well, but I'm supposed to love my husband, but why is this relationship so painful? Or I'm supposed to love my children, why, is, why are they growing up and causing me so much pain then? What am I doing wrong? And honestly, I think this is something that for so long has not really been addressed. There is a proper way to love and there is an improper way to love people as well. Not just money, not just cars, not just big houses. But we are also not supposed to take people and put them at the center of our universe even if it's your own kid, even if it's your own child. There's a reason why Allah told Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, why did, why, have you guys reflect about this story? What did Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, what was he commanded to do? Sacrifice who? That person in his life who he loved most. Why? Did Allah really want him to kill his son? No. What is Allah doing? He is testing him, but there's something else. When he was able to take that decision and he was going to do it, what was he really saying? He was saying, Allah, I love you most. He was saying with his whole heart and his, all of his actions that Allah, I love you most. And so what Allah is doing is actually sort of training him and freeing him and cleansing him of anything else that could compete with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after that, he didn't, he didn't kill his son. It wasn't about killing his son. It was about killing the false attachment. It was about killing the false attachment. So it can be to your children too. It can be to your husband. It can be to those who are halal for you to love. It is halal for you to want money. It is halal for you to love your spouse and your children. But the problem is when we love them in the wrong way. We love them as we should only love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, you know, the, the question then comes, you know, okay, practically, well, how do we start to change that? And, 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 you know, the concept of, which brings me back to the title, the original title, Reclaim Your Heart. It's this idea that we give our hearts to these other things. We give our hearts to things of this life, the people in this life, the status, the money, um, you know, the, the, the things that are temporary. And when you give your heart to something that is not intended to have your heart, then that's when your heart breaks. The idea is we need to take it back and we need to give it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means now that we continue to love. It's, nobody's saying that you don't love these things. But what happens when you love God most is now your love for these other things become healthy love and not unhealthy love. Because believe me, when you take the creation, whether it's your spouse or it's your children or it's your money or it's your status, and you put it at the center where God should be, that is not a healthy love. 
And it's not a peaceful love, and it's not an enjoyable love. In fact, it's very, very painful, and it's very torturous. So if you find that there's some relationship that you have, whether it's with your job, or with your money, or with your family, that is just incredibly unhealthy, and it's causing you so much pain and anxiety, know for sure that there's a problem in the way that you're attached to it. There's a problem in the type of attachment. There's a problem in the love, the type of love. Don't think that you're loving a lot because you're obsessed. In fact, you're harming that which you're loving in that way. You are actually harming that child. You're actually harming that spouse. You're actually, you're, this isn't a healthy love. It's a dependent love. And a dependent love on the creation kills both the, the thing that you're dependent on and yourself. It hurts both. The only way to love in a healthy way and in an unselfish way is when your only dependency is on God. Because you see that there's a difference between needing something and loving something. There is a difference between needing something and loving something. And it's when you need something that you actually harm that which you need and you harm yourself. So the relationships, in order for them really to be healthy, it cannot be based on these false dependencies. The only way to be healthy is to have your fill by God and your relationship with Him. And then now when you love, you can love in a healthy way. You, you can give, you can give to your children, you can give to your spouse, but it isn't this sort of addiction, this need. It's not the love of a beggar, but in fact it's a very generous person because the fill is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Practically, how do, you, how do you get there? I'm going to give you just one, what I, one thing that like conceptually, which I think is the easiest way. Um, let me give you this example. You know how little kids, if they see a toy on TV, suppose you know, they see a commercial, and there's this new uh, toy car that's on the, the, the commercial, and this child just falls in love with the car. It's a toy, it's a Ferrari, but it's a toy. And that child can't think of anything else, right? I want that car. I want that car. It becomes an obsession with the child. Every day asking their parents, buy me that car, buy me that car. Go, you know, he walks by the, the store window, sees the car, wants the car, wants the car. Really can't think of anything else. This is hard. Now try giving, fine. Finally the kid gets the car. He's holding the car in his hand. Try taking that car out of that child's hand. It's not going to be, is it going to be easy? No, this, this child is extremely attached to this toy and you cannot take it out of his hand. But let me ask you this. What happens to that child if he were to see a real car? So he is so in love with this toy car, the toy Ferrari, right? Right? But what happens when he grows up and he sees a real Ferrari? What happens now to his previous obsession with the toy car? the false version, what happens? Is it hard to take that car out of his hand anymore? Yes or no? Once he sees the real thing, it's not hard anymore. Can someone tell me why? Because he saw something better. It's really very simple. You know they say you never get over someone until you find someone else to replace them, to preferably someone better, right? This is the concept I'm trying to convey now. Why is it so hard for us to let go of things of this life? It's because we haven't seen something better. There is something better than this life. But we don't see it. It's just this concept in the back of our head we learned about when we were little. Yeah, we know there's a hereafter. Yeah, we know there's a Jannah. But we don't really see it. We're not really conscious of it. We don't remember it because we're always constantly remembering this life. We don't really sit and think and reflect and prepare for that life which is better. Because any time you take the false version and the real version and you put them next to each other, guess what happens to the false version? It's, it's nothing. Now my attachment to that thing, it's not hard to break anymore. 
Yeah? The, the ex does, is nothing once you find a new partner, right? It's not hard anymore. But it's only hard when you don't see something better to replace it. Allah has given us something better, but we just don't see it. We haven't seen the real car. We have not seen the real car. We don't see it. We're so focused on the toy. So focused on this life. You, you prefer the life of this world when the, when the, when the other life, when the, the hereafter, is better and more lasting. What's the problem with this life? Two things. It's not perfect. Anybody, anybody had a perfect life? Anyone? It doesn't matter how much money you have, how much status you have, how much power you have, how much beauty you have, you will never have a perfect life. Am I right? What else is wrong with this life? What else is the problem? Is it doesn't last. No matter how nice your car is, no matter how big your house is, no matter how beautiful you are, it all passes away. You can never have it forever. This life is imperfect by its very nature. Allah is telling us that there's another life that is better and more lasting. It is perfect and it doesn't come to an end. So why are we preferring this life? Why are we so caught up in the toy car? It's only because we don't have something better to compare it to. Similarly, why are we so caught up in the creation? Because we don't see the creator. Okay, we live our lives obsessed with the creation. People, what are people thinking? What are people saying? What are people doing? But we spend very little time worrying and thinking about what does Allah think of me? What am I doing for Allah? What, you know, is Allah pleased with me? It's all, are the people pleased with me? Are the people displeased with me? What are they gonna say about me? What are they gonna think about me? Even parents, they tell their kids, what are people going to say? It's like, it's, that's all we see. And so we can't get over this, this again, this, this false attachment because we haven't seen the real thing. We haven't seen the creator. We only see the creation. And so practically, how do I apply this practically? We need to increase in our remembrance of the real thing. It's very simple. There's no fancy equation. It's as Allah tells us to remember Him and remember Him a lot. We don't remember Him enough. Even if we pray five times a day, let's be real. What are we thinking about when we're praying? What are we thinking about? We're thinking about whatever it is that we were doing before we prayed and whatever it is we're going to do after we pray and what we're going to wear tomorrow, what we're going to do at the meeting. We're not actually even thinking about the prayer. When is the time that we're actually thinking about the real thing? We are so caught up in the false model. That's our problem, really very simply put. We need to increase in that time that we're reflecting and seeing the real thing. So in that example, we need to spend more time seeing the real Ferrari. And then the, you know, the, the other one, the, the, the toy isn't so shiny anymore. It's really not that special. And it doesn't become as difficult to let go. We have to have more time where we really are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not the, not the prayer where it's just our body going up and down, you know, like chickens pecking, as the Prophet them said. That's not prayer in, in reality. We need to have time where we really are remembering Him more. And that is not just prayer, spending time reflecting on His words, the Qur'an, in, increasing in our dua, our, our supplication, increasing in our athqar. The Prophet sallam if you study his life and you look at the, the supplications, there's a lot of different types of collections, uh, ma'thurat and, and, and fortress of a husn al-Muslim and, and that kind of thing. You'll notice that the Prophet ﷺ has a dua for every motion of life. Every motion of life. You leave your house, there's a dua. You come back into your house, there's a dua. You enter the masjid, there's a dua. You leave the masjid, there's a dua. You start driving, there's a dua. You start eating, there's a dua. You finish eating, there's a dua. You start traveling in the airplane, there's a dua. You put on new clothes, there's a dua. Even before intimacy, there's a dua. The idea here is what? 
الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم the people who remember Allah standing and sitting and on their sides Allah describes that these are ulil albab these are the people of understanding those who remember Allah in every position of life standing sitting and on their sides that's how you practically live la ilaha illallah that's how you practically live your purpose of creation وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ أقول إن قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الأرض ميدان